Okay, so we are starting Philippians chapter 2 tonight. Um, and we're going to actually start in, in chapter 1, verse 29. So it kind of makes a little bit more sense. And uh, Paul is the author of Philippians. And this is, this is a letter to the church in Philippi. And if you're following us in Acts, this Sunday will be in chapter 14 and in chapter 17. Is it, is it chapter 17? Either six, 16 or 17, we are going to see Paul start the church in Philippi. And we're going to see twice in this passage that we're going to read tonight. I think we're probably only going to get 18 verses done tonight. Uh, we're, we're going to see that Paul kind of compares us to Christ. Not really compares, but this is what Christ is like. This is how we must model our lives after. And he's going to do that twice tonight. And um, some things, uh, they're going to be hard to understand, especially at the end. And I will do my best to use other scriptures to show you what he's talking about. Okay. Um, so let, let's get started in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29 and 30. Uh, and he says, <clears throat> For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. That this word granted means gifted. <laughs> Suffering doesn't sound like a good gift, does it? Many children compared to what he went through. Well, we're going to see that, I'll tell you, some of us are going to be going through stuff that Jesus went through. But why do you think, why do you think that God calls suffering a gift because it teaches us so much we have to experience some bad to know that good exists okay so i i, I like that answer ashley i like that answer but that's more buddhist did you know that that's more of a buddhist view Okay, okay. Okay, and no, that, that's a fantastic answer, because that's what a lot of Christians think. We, we need to remember, we, as Christians, are not subscribing to an ideology or a religious mindset. We are at war. And we're not at war with the government, and we're not at war with other religions, and we're not at war with other people. It is a spiritual war. The world is under the authority of the dominion of darkness. And God uses us kind of like spiritual Navy SEALs to go into the dominion of darkness with the gospel to take people out of the dominion of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son. Uh, the book of Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 says, He, meaning God the Father, has transferred us from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, 
and the forgiveness of sins. And Paul in 1 Corinthians says that the kingdom of God is not of talk, of, but it's not of speech, but it's of power. The dominion of darkness uses force, uses lust, uses money, uses political power to get what it, it wants. In our suffering, we are made very weak. People who are suffering do not have a lot of strength. And when we are weak, and all we have is Jesus, that is when Jesus says, watch me work. And he uses the weakness of us through our suffering to expand his kingdom. You will never see a great kingdom expander who is not suffering somehow. Did you know that? I do now. When the kingdom of God becomes your everything, because that is where the kingdom of God is where Jesus has all authority in your life over every aspect of your life, your marriage, your parenthood, your career, your recreation, your finances. That's when the kingdom of God is powerful. But in order for God to have authority over that, he has you suffer. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw that I had, and now hear that I still have. What, what's Paul saying? He said, you're, you, you're watching me suffer. W where is Paul? As he's writing this letter, do you guys remember where Paul is? Paul's in prison, writing this. He's in a Roman prison. It, it's a cold, dark, dank, moldy place. You don't go to the chow hall three times a day. You're relying on friends, families, and visitors to actually bring you food and clothing. They don't let you out to go to the bathroom. You go in the corner of the room. There's no toilet. And so he's in this cell, smelling his own stench, relying on the generosity of outsiders to feed him. Is Paul suffering? Yes, he is. And in that suffering, 2,000 years later, he's still making a massive impact in the world. Chapter 2, verse 1. So, stop here. This word so could, could be translated because of this or therefore. Okay. Because of this suffering, 
because of the gift of this suffering, on how God is going to use you in your suffering to expand the kingdom of God because of this. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any, what does that mean? The smallest amount, the smallest amount. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, I know a lot of you are suffering right now, but you're here. Are you here out of obligation? Or are you here out of love? So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, oh, How I've seen the Spirit work through all of you in the last few months. Wow. Any participation in the Spirit and any affection and sympathy, if there's even the the most minuscule of it, what does he say in verse 2? Complete my joy of being of the same mind Okay. Complete my joy of being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. What does he mean by that? Joy is not happiness. Joy is above and beyond happiness. Happiness has to do with circumstances, okay? A bunch of you have probably seen your bank account at zero or below. That's circumstantial. You're probably not happy about that. I'm already there. Yeah. And at the same time, you have joy in your life. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit working through you. Happiness is circumstantial. Don't focus on happiness, okay? Because remember, Paul is suffering in this prison also. He's not standing up on some podium and saying, suffer, suffer. He's in jail. He's in prison for sharing the gospel. And he's saying, being in full accord, meaning be fully unified and have the same mind. This will bring me the greatest joy. Number th- uh, Verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Okay. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. So now, he just gave the definition of humility. A lot of people think that humility means thinking less of yourself. That's not what it is. Humility is thinking of yourself less, meaning putting others ahead of you. So he's saying, when it comes to the kingdom of God, don't Do anything through selfish ambition. Is it okay to be ambitious? Absolutely. But don't be selfish about it. Don't do it for yourself. Do it for the kingdom of God. For the glory of God. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. 
person, like uh, ego. Don't do it for ego. But count others more significant. He didn't say better. He said more significant than yourselves. Uh, I, God is doing an amazing work through Lifehouse Connection right now. And what we're seeing in Lifehouse Connection in North Bay, it takes my breath away. Now, I want to apply this to what we read tonight. Number one, is Elizabeth and Ivan suffering? Yes. Elizabeth has health issues. She's in chronic pain. And in five weeks, Ivan is losing his job. Okay. That's number one. They are suffering. But they have encouragement in Christ. They have comfort from love. They are definitely participating in the Spirit. And they show affection and sympathy. Do they put others ahead of themselves? Well, look at their friends that live on their property. Have they taken good care of them over the last four years? Yes. What has God done? God has done an amazing work through them. Many salvations... And now you see what God has done by them applying this, not even knowing they're applying this. They had 116 people in their house church on Sunday for salvations. I think all in we had eight that day with Lifehouse Connection. And then we had three more today in North Bay Lifehouse Connection. Do you see how the kingdom of God works through power in the gift of our suffering? Okay. Verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests. Okay, so you've got to take care of yourself. That's what Paul is saying. This is what God is saying through Paul. You need to take care of yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Take care of yourself, but take care of others. Every... Sunday, I tell you, at the, in the introduction to every sermon, you can't send me money. We refuse to open a bank account. Can't send it. But, but Jesus talked more about money than any other topic in the Bible. So in your small house churches... Pool your money together and go and bless, bless someone in the community. Take care of yourselves and then take care of others. And look at what Ivan and Liz and Ashley and Hope and Deb and a bunch of others. What are you guys doing? You're buying Bibles for people, and you're handing them out to people who need Bibles. You think God's not blessing that? You think that you're not expanding the kingdom of God like that? It's amazing. 
verse 5. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Okay. So he's going to... Paul... Paul would fail in English class. Your language arts teacher that you had in high school would kick Paul out of the class. The run-on sentences that Paul does, massive, massive, like big no-no. But in the Greek, it makes perfect sense. So he's saying, have this in mind among yourselves. So as the church, uh, think about this, meditate on what Paul just said about suffering, about um, being in one accord and of one mind for the kingdom of God, loving each other deeply, looking not only to your own interests, but specifically to the interests of others. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus Christ or in Christ Jesus. This, this is what I want you to do. This, this is yours. This is your power for the kingdom of God to expand through you. I'll tell you, it's not because you have a super awesome pastor Bible study teacher. It's not. It's not because we have a new type of church or a, an ancient type of church in a new way. It's not. It's because in our weakness, when we don't focus, but instead of focusing on our weakness and our pain and our suffering as a bad thing, if we do that, the kingdom of God will not grow, th grow, grow through us. But when we realize we need the suffering, we need the weakness for the power of God to work through because it's polar opposite of the dominion of darkness. There's more power in my weakness than all the power in the dominion of darkness. This is yours in Christ Jesus. Having this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now he's going to start talking about Jesus Christ. And we need to pay attention to this because now we need to model this. Who, who though, was in the form of God. Okay. Um. In Colossians, it says that in Jesus Christ, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Jesus in the form of God that we can see. Jesus is our visual representation of God. Because Jesus in John chapter 1 says, No one has seen God except he who has come from heaven. So when the Lord God was in the garden with Adam and Eve, they did not see God, the God the Father or God the Holy Spirit. They saw God the Son where God the Father and God the Holy Spirit are pleased to dwell, the triune God inside Jesus Christ. It was Jesus they saw. I hope I'm not going too deep for you guys. Who though he was, uh, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. What is Paul talking about? 
when Jesus came, born of the Virgin Mary, he came as a servant, and we're going to see this. And he said, I am going to not hold on to my divinity. I will let God work through me, but I am 100% God, 100% man. It's called the hypostatic union, theologically. But I'm not going to grasp onto my godness. He's modeling for us what it's like to be weak. And how powerful was Jesus when he was on the earth? Extremely powerful. Walking on water, healing the sick, raising Lazarus from the dead, feeding the 5,000, feeding the 4,000. How did he do it? Through weakness. He let God work through him. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. How did he empty himself? By taking the form of a servant. Your Bible might have a footnote here. And that footnote will say, slave. You know when I share the gospel, and we get to Romans 10, 9 and 10. So if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And I always say, stop here. What does Lord mean? Who do you pay your rent to? The landlord. Why do you call him the landlord? Because he owns the land. So if I'm confessing Jesus as Lord, what am I saying? He owns me. Now, if what do you call a person who is owned by another person? A slave. And what did Jesus do? Jesus came as a slave of God. He emptied himself of his divinity. Still being, I, 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 I can't. I can't even wrap my head around it. He's still 100% God and 100% man, but he's emptying himself. He says, I'm going to become weak. I'm going to become weak so that the kingdom of God can work through me. And I'm going to become a slave. And he says, and being born in the likeness of men. Have you noticed he did, Paul didn't say he was born as a man. He was born in the likeness of men. Guys, am, am I going too deep for you here? Am I confusing you? No. What's that? It's either a yes or no. It might be. It's thumbs up to me. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Thumbs up. Okay. By taking uh, the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. You notice he didn't say he was born as a man, but in the likeness of men. What does that mean? Okay. Keep your finger here. Go to Psalm 51. Is it Psalm 51 or 53? I have to remember here. Yeah, Psalm 51. And it's going to be verse 5. Psalm 51, verse 5. Tell me when you're there. Got it. Okay. Okay, so Psalm 51, verse 5. Now, this psalm, if you see the beginning of it, the heading says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. 
And there's a little caption underneath and it says, A Psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So what happened is David, if you guys don't know the story, David was on his rooftop. It was a time of war. He did not go out to war. And he's on his rooftop. You're thinking, that's kind of weird. Well, in Israel, your rooftop is like your back deck. Okay? He's up there, and he's looking across to the other houses, and there's a woman bathing because she's trying to, her name is Bathsheba, and it's she's just finishing her time of the month, and she's doing her ritual cleansing. But she's bathing, and she's naked. And he says to his servants, go get her. I'm sleeping with her. She becomes pregnant, and it's one of his best friend's wives. And he tries to get his friend Uriah, brings him back, gets him drunk, says, hey, go sleep with your wife. And he doesn't. He stays outside to guard the king. And so he says, look, says to one of his generals, he says, look, uh, he writes a letter, seals it, gives it to Uriah, says, give this to Joab, my commander. Joab reads it and says, "When put, put Uriah where the fighting is the worst, is the, is the strongest, and then leave him alone and get, let him get shot. Because David knew that if he got caught sleep in adultery, by law, he had to die. So now he committed adultery and he had a man killed. And now he's broken over his sin. In verse 5 it says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin. Did my mother conceive me? Please pay, pay attention to the prepositions. It did not say that he was brought forth by iniquity and, he, and not by sin. In sin. What does this mean? The moment that Adam and Eve sinned. Oh, actually, it was the moment that Adam sinned. Eve sinned first, but the moment that Adam sinned. The DNA changes. And the moment... That sperm meets the egg and creates that zygote inside that DNA is the sinful nature. So now, Ephesians tells us that we are born into the dominion of darkness. Let me clarify that. That's not true. When we're born, we're born into the sinful nature. We go into the dominion of darkness when we end up committing our first sin. But because we have the sinful nature, we can't help but sin. Okay? Think about it this way. My DNA tells me that I that I will grow to be six foot five. That's how tall I am. I can't do anything about that. That's in my DNA. Same thing with the sinful nature. It's in your DNA. This is why it was so important For Jesus to be born of a virgin. Because now he's not forced to sin. He does not have that sinful DNA. If Jesus was to sin, it would be by choice. And Jesus never sinned. And so this is why it says in verse 8, and being found in human form. Oh, sorry, verse 7, be emptying himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. 
not as a man, but in the likeness. So he's human, but without the sinful nature. Verse 8, and being found in human form, okay, I want you to look at this. This is the third time the word form is used in two verses. Verse 6, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form. So if we're going to look like Jesus, if we want to see the power of God work through us, empty ourselves, become weak, and become a slave of Jesus Christ. Verse 8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I want you to go back to verse 3. Chapter 2, verse 3 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. What was Jesus doing going to the cross? He went there in humility because he saw you as more significant. He laid down his life for you. When Paul tells us to do things in humility, he's saying, look to Christ on how he was practicing humility. He went to the cross in weakness. And through the weakness on the cross, it became all-powerful. God's ways are not the world's ways. Paul says in, in another epistle, I boast in my weaknesses because in my weakness, he is made strong. God is strength in my weakness. Why is Lifehouse Connection exploding so much? People are suffering. We are weak. We have zero finances. And therefore, it's a move of God, not us. It's God working through us. Amen. Praise God. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, okay, biblical hermeneutics. Whenever you see a hermeneutics, for those of you that don't know that term, hermeneutics is the word we use for Bible interpretation. How do you properly interpret the Bible? Okay. Whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, you always must have to ask, why is the therefore, therefore? Therefore, because of who Jesus is and because of what Jesus did, he emptied himself, took the form of a servant in the likeness of man. Because of this, therefore, Look what happened. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every name. What does that mean, the name above every name? Paul is a Hebrew. He's a Jew. 
He's a Christian Jew, but he has a Hebrew heritage. In Hebrew, your name is your persona. It's your character. Okay? It's who you are. Keep your finger here. Turn to the Old Testament book of Judges and go to Judges 13 before we go any further. Judges 13? Yeah, 1 3. Yeah. And we're going to start in verse 15. Okay. Tell me when you're there. You're there? Okay. So now, God, uh, the angel of the Lord, in the Old Testament, when you see the angel of the Lord talking with somebody, that's Jesus Christ talking with them. We call it, the theological term is called a Christophany. You can, you can now say that word, Christophany, and sound really theologically smart. And what a Christophany is, is the pre-incarnate Christ. Incarnate uh, is Latin for in the flesh. So before Jesus came in the flesh. Like, have you ever had chili con carne? That is chili with meat. So Jesus before the meat suit. Okay? Manoah. Manoah, um, this man is about to become the father of Samson, the judge. And the angel of the Lord comes to Manoah to tell him what's going to happen. Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate, is going to tell Manoah what's going to happen. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please, let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, if you detain me, I will not eat, eat of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name? So that when your words come true, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Does anyone else have a different translation other than what does yours say oh, instead of wonderful? Uh, which one are you referring to? Uh, verse uh, 18, and it says, And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? What does yours say, Hope? Um, verse 18, yeah. it says, he replied, why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. There you then go. Then Manoah took a goat, he took a young goat, did, did together you... with a grain offering. Yeah. My translation is saying it's wonderful, not, not because it's beautiful. Come on in! But because you can't understand it. My character is so vast. If I told you my name, you couldn't understand it. It would drive you insane. So anyway, let's go back to Philippians. Therefore, God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So... Every name of God in the Bible, if you were um, either at camp with us at my campground when we all met together or you watched it online uh, a month and a half ago, uh, Deb's friend Deb sang a song on the hundred different names for Jesus in the Bible. And now... God is exalting Jesus to give him the name above every name. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of 
Jesus. Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Whoa. What is the most powerful name in all eternity? Did you see it? Jesus. In Hebrew, do you know what Jesus means? It means Yahweh. Yahweh is the name of God in the Bible, meaning I am who I am. The, the God whose character is so vast that you cannot understand his name, so eternal that you can't understand his name, that God, that Yahweh. Jesus means Yahweh is salvation. Amen. And Christ means the chosen one. Let's put this together. Because Jesus emptied himself, because he took the form of a slave in human likeness, in his absolute weakness. Jesus says in the Gospels, I did not come to be served, but to serve. Because he emptied himself, because he made himself weak, what happens? The eternal God says, And he now has the name above every name, the most powerful name in the world. The most powerful name in eternity. Yahweh is salvation. Therefore, God has Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Where, where will every knee bow? In heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every angel in heaven, every person on earth, and every demon in hell is forced to bow at the name of Jesus, Yahweh is salvation and every tongue will confess that Yahweh is salvation the chosen one is Lord and master because Lord means master right Yahweh is salvation the chosen one is Lord to the glory of God the Father did you see that? When we act like Jesus, when we act like Jesus, and we go in weakness and submission and suffering and humility as a slave, the King of kings of all eternity works through us to bring glory to God by expanding his kingdom through the power of Yahweh is salvation. Amen. Praise God. Verse 12. Therefore, 
What does therefore mean in, in, in Bible interpretation? Therefore, because of that, because of that, my beloved, how does he, uh, how does he address the church in Philippi? Beloved. I've read this so many times, but now that I'm in the position that I'm in, that I am the pastor of Lifehouse Connection, and we have 26 house churches on the go, I can see Paul's pastoral heart for the churches in Philippi. Like my heart for Lifehouse and Langford and North Bay and Quebec and Sherwood Park, Spruce Grove, Medicine Hat, Texas, Gambia, South Africa, Kenya, Scotland, England. I get it now. I get it. I get the love he has for these these people in these churches. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, as you've always obeyed the Lord in weakness, in servitude, now so now uh, so now not only in my presence but much more in my absence. Listen. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Oh, I want you to hear what he did not say. He did not say work for your salvation. You're saved. He's saying, work it out. Live it out. How do you live it out? You live it out in weakness. You live it out in suffering. You live it out in slavery to Christ. Work it out. How? In fear and and trembling. Why? Because I need to look like Jesus Not the morally superior Jesus that the world says, oh, you're a Christian. Why don't you act more like Jesus? Empty yourselves. Let God work through you in your weakness and suffering. And do it with fear and trembling, knowing I can't do this in my power. There's no way the kingdom of God expands by the power of Jason or the power of Liz or the power of Debbie or the power of Sally or the power of Matthew or the power of Ken. It doesn't. It's through Jesus and Jesus only. And the only way Jesus is going to work through me is if I'm suffering, I'm weak, and I'm his slave. That's it. That's the secret to powerfully growing the kingdom. It's polar opposite of the dominion of darkness. And you should be terrified to try it any other way. Fear and trembling. Work it out. And if you try to do it in your own power, it should scare the hell into you. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Empty yourself. Suffer for Christ's sake. Be 
his slave in all humility. So it will be God who works in you. You want to see a powerful man of God? You will see the weakest man out there. Because it's God who works through him. Or her. And how does he work? For his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Stop here. Why? Because if you're grumbling or disputing, you're living for yourself. You got ego. Ego kills. The kingdom of God. It kills the power of Jesus Christ. Yahweh is salvation, the chosen one. It kills his power working through you. Why? Because you're acting in the power of the dominion of darkness instead of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God comes in power through our weakness. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Why? That you may be blameless and innocent. Children of God. Without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. You want to be a light in the world? Suffer. Empty yourself. Put others ahead of you and be Christ's slave. Be the lowest servant in the kingdom. The lower you are as a servant, the stronger Christ will work through you to expand the kingdom of God. And you will shine as lights in this crooked, twisted generation. Verse 16. Holding fast to the word of life. What does that mean? Holding on to, believing the whole Bible. Hold on tightly to it. Make it your life. The idea that he gives to hold fast to this is... And a man will leave his mother and father and hold fast to his wife. That's how you need to hold the Bible. Hold fast like a husband holds fast to his wife and a wife holds fast to her husband. Do that with the Bible. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast to the word of life so what so is means because so that in the day of Christ I may, may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain Why would he think this way? What's the day of Christ? The day of Christ is the time of the rapture of the church. And the theological term is the Bema Seat Judgment. You're not going to see the term Bema Seat in the New Testament, but you'll read about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And the Bema Seat That judgment is a judgment for rewards. And he says, I have run the race and I want to be proud of you because I want to know that I've emptied myself to the fullest so that the kingdom of God would live through you and grow through you that my reward and your reward in heaven 
will be great. Verse 17. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. What does that mean? In the Old Testament, in the law, there was a kind of offering called a drink offering, and it was wine. Okay? And as you have the burnt sacrifice on the altar of God, you would pour that wine as an offering, an aromatic offering to the Lord. Now, before we start really dissecting this, keep your finger here and turn to Romans chapter 12. Now, after we finish the book of Acts on Sunday mornings, we're going to go into Romans. And let me explain Romans to you. Romans is the closest thing to a systematic theology of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we have written out in the Bible. Okay? And Romans is split into two parts. Part 1 is chapters 1 through 11, and part 2 is chapters 12 through 16. Part 1 is doctrine. Doctrine about, doctrine just means teaching. Okay? And it's teaching about what the gospel is. Part 2, starting in chapter 12 is application. How do you live this teaching out now? And I want you to see the first things that we must do as Christians at the very beginning to live out Christ, to live out the gospel. How do we apply the gospel to our lives? This is how, the first steps, 12.1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice? How do you do that? You empty yourself. You don't live for you anymore. Empty yourself. Be willing to suffer. Put others ahead of you so that Christ can work through you. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Do you see that? The only way you're going to be acceptable to God is not because you pray to prayer. It's because you're emptying yourself. That's why Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You can't do this in your own power. You can't. It's impossible. Empty yourself. And present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Your translation might, be say, might say your spiritual service. Did you get that? That's the first step in applying the gospel. So now we go back to Philippians. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, as what's Paul saying, as, you're, as you are emptying yourself for Christ, me suffering in this prison, I am emptying myself for you so that the kingdom of God will expand greatly 
through you. As you're emptying yourself, I'm emptying myself. Even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Why? Because I'm doing what I'm telling you to do. Empty yourself. Look like Jesus. Take the form of a servant so that the power of Yahweh is salvation, the chosen one, will work through you to expand the kingdom of God. You can't do it. Only God can do it through you, and you need to get your hiney out of the way so God can work. Amen.